Hi everyone, it's Tom with the LSE recap of this week. We just had week three of the LSE Spring Split finished. So let's take a look at all the matches that were played and highlight some interesting moments. And at the end, as always, share some thoughts in general on the team's performances and how they've grown. So we started the week with Misfits versus Excel. And um, I don't think many people had high expectations of either of these teams heading into it. Obviously, Misfits had had a pretty good start to the split, but fell off a bit later and then Excel finished last week on a win but overall has seemed a bit shaky especially in the early game and it did start off pretty interestingly because Olaf and Pantheon were both left open in the uh, pick and bend phase which are two champions that we haven't seen a lot of because they're considered very strong and the most interesting pick definitely came out from Excel who picked uh, Cho'Gath for Christ their top laner another Interesting pick uh, a bit was Veteo on LeBlanc and Veteo has said in the past that his two main champions are Zoe and LeBlanc so it was interesting to see how that would play out. It was entertaining in the beginning, uh, both teams were ganking each other quite a bit but it wasn't very clean so there mostly were even trades every time that either team would engage and after 10 minutes the game slowed a bit down, Misfits was more comfortable on the map and XL did just miss a few trades barely they would engage or be engaged on and almost get a trade back but misfits would escape with just a few points of life so misfits from here on out climbed ahead a bit more but they started also playing more scrappily and i think an interesting point in the match definitely was the turning point where you could see how poorly misfits were choosing their finds which actually turned out to be a turning point in a match but I feel like Misfits are slowing down a bit. Having trouble upping the tempo. As I say that though, Caster Curse. Now they're firing, firing back. Copying on the backside though. He's the one you have to keep your eyes on. It's so far just a one for one. Here it in the area. Vito on the backside though, in the middle of no man's land. Pantheon all going in though. Feathers fly, the leap in, the knock up, the take down. No Aegis Assault to block that one out. Cry's gonna grab. Misfits kept having trouble picking good fights. Excel became too strong. Misfits was like hitting a brick wall uh, they were running into in the shape of Excel, and Excel won their game. Then we had SK versus Mad Lions, and I think this in the draft phase surprised many people because uh, SK picked up a Jarfan. And not even for the jungle, but for the support role. So we had treats on a Jarvan 4, and it even got the opening kill on it. So this game was very much in SK's favor from the get-go. I think it was also very noteworthy that Mad Lions was not having a good game, and especially Carty was not playing well on Tristana. He kept jumping in fights thinking he could take them, but he would definitely take more on his plate than he could handle. So... Um, it gave SK a big lead early on and SK didn't really let go of it but I have to say that Mad Lions also didn't really adjust their play style. They kept going in trying to fight fights that they couldn't win and um, yeah overall as I said right not a good performance and this time especially from Carty a, a very bad game. I, I think maybe he just didn't really think of the champ of champion on Tristana as uh, something that he had played a lot so he might as well try to play it more bravely this game so he could try to feel out the champion better but it was definitely not a good game and SK Gaming had a very easy win and honestly quite surprising over Mad Lions here. Then we had G2 versus Vitality and obviously G2 came off the back of a weekend against Shokan of Fear where they lost and as G2 has a tendency to do, when they lose a game, then they come back much stronger with uh, bloodlust and a thirst for revenge on whoever faces them next. And poor Vitality was the sacrificial lamp here. Um, interesting pick was Wounder in, in the top lane. We saw another Jarvan, this time for Vitality, but I think that this game overall can be summed up that G2 was just playing with their food, really. Vitality had little to no chance at all in the game. At any point, they didn't even dare to play proactively, which was a bit boring. But G2 was uh, ganking, jumping on their targets, knowing that they could easily take them down. And I think one of the f fun examples of this is this clip. In the middle lane, and that's how it is already down to half HP, so this should be taken pretty quickly. Comp is looking for a flank position. Shigenda there as well. Melita uses the stopwatch. In goes Schemes. The Cataclysm coming out. Yankos with the stopwatch of his own. Wonder on his way down from the top lane. Yankos still alive somehow, a sliver of HP. Keeps him just about surviving, and now Wonder's looking for the flank position, flash away, Lebrov almost down, Reckless with a final Q, gets the kill, and you can see Comp trying to escape, caught up with the deadly push, oh. they're Valm warping in, they want the kill, 
comes on the other side of the wall. <laughs> so yeah, overall G2 was just two dominance and not much to say about that game, honestly. It was fun to watch G2 feel so comfortable, but I wouldn't really call it a match. Then we had Shokan over here versus Rogue. And Shoka came out with a really good teamfight draft. They had a Camille, they had a Jarvan, Oriana, Kai's, and Arel. And if you think about all those champions, how they interact with each other is really good, right? You have Jarvan who can jump onto somebody, and then Oriana pops her ult. You have Rel who can do the same, who also works together with Kaisa. So honestly, the draft from Shokan over here was just perfect. It was really, really good. Um, Rogue had not as good as a draft at all. They didn't really have a front frontliner and it can work if your opponent has like a slow composition maybe that has trouble moving around the map so you as a composition without a front line can push in the side lanes and really try to put pressure there but i don't know rogue um that they they just needed a composition they needed to start strongly with their composition and they didn't really do it it was okay right i mean rogue is a team that rarely is going to lose the very early game um, in, in such a dominating way. Um, they always will know how to pull out even some way, but they just weren't ahead enough. And I think that you could see that Schalke just really knew how to execute with this composition. And they showed this throughout the entire game, from the early game where they grouped up when they felt that Rogue was going to gank, or if they wanted to gank, and later on, especially in team fights, Shokan of here was just a unit moving around, whereas Rogue couldn't really move as a unit, because if they would grew up, group up, Shokan would jump in and punish them with all the ultimates they had, right? And this game, I would say, was still pretty close, given how much the advantage Shokan had in their draft, but in the end, Shokan still won. I think for them, it's a really important win, not only because it's Rogue and they're a very, um, very good team at the moment to get a win against, but also because you just have a um, a team, Shao Kun Fear, who started poorly in the opening weekend and now definitely has found a way how they want to play, and they really seem like a team, so I was very impressed by that performance uh, from them. I definitely was not as impressed from the performance that uh, Fnatic and Australis put up while... I think I would be impressed with Astralis' performance because they held their own very well against Fnatic. But uh, Fnatic's performance was just really shit. It was not by any means the performance a team of their caliber should put down. Um, you had we, We've had this talk before about Fnatic where their entire game is literally just scrappy fights all over the place. And keep on fighting, keep on fighting, keep on fighting. Hoping that your individual skill or your veteranship in playing on the top level will give you an advantage, but um, uh, I don't know, man. When I looked when I looked at this game, I'll let me just say that I was very happy with how Astralis played. They showed that even though many people have rated them lowly, and uh, there, there are many players on their team that have had the chance in the past to play in the early scene haven't really proven that they belong in the absolute top, right? That they're still making improvements, even though they are pretty veteran players already and they, as a team, are coming together more. So they really did put up a good fight against Fnatic, but in the end, Fnatic did still win. I don't think that this is a fight that um, is in any way memorable or should be memorable in the long term because it just wasn't pretty. So yeah. Uh, disappointing showing from Fnatic and after this I really thought well they, they just might be a middle tier team after all but it is what it is uh, they, they managed to get the win so hopefully they will be able to forget their performance as well and move on as for Astralis I hope they take some good lessons from that they stepped up and actually um, had a pretty decent showing and keep improving every week then we went to day two Misfits versus Shokan of Fear kicked it off. Another great draft from Shokan of Fear. And Misfits did try to make things work in the early game, but Shokan held Rome very well. Um, when it came to the later stage of the game, I think Shokan understood perfectly, again, how the composition should work. They knew when to set up fights, how to set up fights. They picked their uh, targets very well. And even if Misfits seemed to have an advantage uh, in their engage, Shokan managed to bend it back in their favor. And 
I think this is once again, you see, are seeing the development of Misfits, which is a downward trend from week one, where um, they haven't really found how they want to execute the team fights or how they want to play with their composition. And Shulk and Ophir knowing exactly how they want to play it. And I think one of the key moments in this match is one of those fights where Misfits dives in or, you know, like like picks the fight and Shao Kano Fear just says, okay, well, um, your loss. So let's take a look. Throw away their advantage. And uh, by moving towards, wait a second, limit. Here we go. So we step just a little bit, Hakus. The chase is on. Rats are trying to do what he can with the goal. Drinking hits the grand star fall, and is what you talked about. And uh, Shaoka can all dive bomb in as soon as they catch one of you. Abadage, Abadage dives onto the back line. He tries to get Vanda with the rocket. That he'll be able to secure the kill. So yeah, Misfit just got pushed out of the game. Didn't have much to say overall. Shaoka just looking comfortable, looking confident in their play, and got the win. Then as the second match, we had SK versus XL, and. Um, the most noteworthy thing about this game, I would say, is that there was an extremely long pause which interrupted the game because of a bug that was reported. Um, but before that pause, Excel already looked pretty okay, um, looked pretty fine, but SK definitely still had a chance right in the game um, in, in terms of comeback mechanics. But I think after that long pause ended, you could see that Excel just was way more comfortable with continuing to play in the game. They got their objective set. They picked the team fights better. I don't know what SK was thinking in some of the fights they picked um, or how they approached the objectives, but I definitely think that they should go back and review this match. As for XL, I think that something that stood out to me is that because they're a team that hasn't had a pretty good early game and as a result of this couldn't close out games even if they had somewhat of a lead. Um... You know, they, they really didn't manage to snowball any advantage they had. And I think that that is something they did very well against SK. They just were very sure of what to do. And I think that's a massive improvement for this team. And one of the members that stepped up definitely here is Kreis. I think so far it has been Patrick who has had to carry the team a lot. Uh, which is a continuation of the trend we saw in the summer split last year. And in general, um, because Patrick is just an insane AD carry. But I think that Kreis has definitely been playing well last weekend and i think that's a very good thing for the team right otherwise enemies can just know okay we have to shut down your bot lane and then you won't do anything but this time um there was a lot of pressure put on cries every game um even on in day one he just got ganked a lot and uh had to hold his own but he he has done pretty well and definitely signs of improvements for that team overall still think that the jungle, uh, Dan can um, has a lot of room for improvement. If I had to pick, um, I'd probably say that Tori is still the most uncertain factor in XL, but I think that um, Dan has to step up more to be impactful in the game because jungle is so important at the moment. And it always is, right? Can help your lanes um, out very much. So overall, XL played very well. SK didn't. Um, rough loss for them. Um, the pass maybe had some influence there. It was a really long one, so who knows? But both teams are met with these um, with the same situation, right? And I think Excel bounced back strongly over uh, after that. And yeah, a good weekend for them, 2-0. So props to them. Then we had Mad Lions versus Vitality. Um, we had the first Seraphine bot lane in the LEC. It was for Karzi. And it's not a champion that we've seen a lot of. Obviously, um, it has been rumored to be very strong. I've seen it a bit in support. I, I think in some of the other leagues we've seen it in a bot lane. I think in the LCS, if I'm not mistaken. Um, by now, we've also seen it in the mid lane. But definitely hadn't seen it in the bot lane in the LEC um, for Karzi or any other bot laner. So that was a good, uh, a cool pick. And Vitality, um, I think... Many people would say that Vitality so far in the LEC hasn't been very proactive in what they do. But this game, they actually started much more proactive than in previous games. They got the kills. Um, Skeens on the Pantheon was playing well. I, I think it was 3-0 at some point. Helping out his lanes. Playing much more to his team. And much more like all the other junglers are playing. Because before the match, they showed a stat that Skeens overall just had not been doing much. Not, he was down in farm. He was down in his... Um, proximity to his laners so he definitely sought to compensate that stat um, in this game and he did pretty well however vitality still as a team is just not playing as a team and they didn't really know how to convert the lead they had into more 
Mad Lions, on the other hand, they managed to pick their team fights very well. They saw that, okay, if Vitality was going for an objective that wasn't really that important, for example, like a second Drake or something like this, I think it was, that Mad Lions just backed off and said, okay, well, we can't fight here. Whereas if they could engage, they definitely did, and they picked their fights well and they set them up very well. I think the standout players for this match were definitely Armut and El Yoya. Um, Armut on the Aatrox and um, El Yoya on the Olaf. Uh, both had a Gore Drinker. I mean, that's, you know, it's kind of, kind of what happens uh, in these days in the meta. But let's just take a look at an example of Mad Lions playing their team fights well. I think that they've deserved the highlight, especially after their poor performance on day one. They bounce back very well and they executed team fights very well as well. Right of Vitality, will he do it again? That's the hook to kick things off. Molita buying a bit of space with the scatter of the week, but that's a major cooldown gone. Dragon Armut still buying space in the meantime. Skeens manages to get that one. The 50 50, he's going to win out. He has to flash to retreat, but it's Armut on the flank. Now they're going to look to extend the play. A quick dash out from the Pantheon, though, means he dodges the charm, but he'll still go down. Eyes on Armut. He is the one with all the gold barreling through this team. Karzi unkillable. Support dropping. Armut looking for the follow up on the comp. The flash forward to finish. So, yeah. Mad Lions bounced back strongly after day one and got a win, which is definitely good for their mood and should be good heading into the final week before we go to a one week break. Now, the final two matches of today were um, were something else. Uh, I definitely would recommend watching them all. I'm going to try my best to summarize all the action that happened in them. But um, Rogue versus Stardust first. Obviously, heading into the match, Rogue was a massive favorite because they had played, been playing very well. Astralis, a team that many considered a um, lower tier team. Here's truly included. But Astralis came prepared and they whipped out something incredibly fun and exciting to watch. They picked a Skarner, Caitlyn and Thresh in their uh, jungle bot and support respectively. And the idea of this is very simple. Skarner ults somebody, he drags them uh, back a bit, and then Thresh throws out a lantern, and uh, the Skarner, as well as the target that he is dragging with, are thrown back into the enemy team. And it was uh, <laughs> it was definitely fun to watch. We'll, we'll, we'll get to a clip later, but uh, they did start really well too. They got two uh, kills on Nukedog Syndra. There were 4-2 in kills at 15 minutes overall. Uh, they had two drakes. So things were looking good for Australis. Now, at this point, Rogue did try to take towers in return. They got two top towers, which obviously nets them a lot of gold, which is all, always going to be funneled into Hansama for them. Or Larsen sometimes, but in this case it was Hansama again. Still though, um, the things were looking good for Australis. I do think that Rogue played the team fights better overall, but the individuals on our side were so strong already. It was so incredibly difficult for Rogue to pick any fight because if they did, uh, without the cooldowns of Astralis being on, right? So if Astralis like, had their ults and flashes up, for example, Rogue just couldn't do anything. And Astralis knew this very well. They applied pressure on the map. Now, I will now show you one of the examples of how fun Astralis' composition was to watch. And Zanzara, who is uh, very known for his Skarner play from his last year in a Go Rogue um, in the ERLs. Uh, let's let's just take a look at how how their team worked. That hook, not the end of the world. That said, we've now got a 2-0-1 Hansama with the Collector. So it's also going to have to give a little Zanzara. respect to him. And there we go! There is the <laughs> I love it! I love to see it! <laughs> Now, what did Astralis do with this lead? Well, they got the Baron, uh, they even got the Ocean Soul. And at this point, you have to say, you know, even though Ocean Souls are not as strong as they were last year, it's still an incredibly important objective to have. Obviously, their regen is incredibly high. Now, at this point, obviously, Astralis should never give away this the, their lead, right? Um, Rogue did try their best to try to apply some pressure on any lane they could find, but Astralis was... In general, just quickly to turn around and be there and play. Uh, yeah, because they had the strong objectives to push back and nullify basically most of the damage that Rogue had done. Or deal it back in an even stronger manner. However, I have to say that Rogue fought so impressively and basically off the back of two team fights Where they got a pick and baited Astralis into using their utility using their their summoner spells or their ults prematurely trying to find an engage and rogue knew okay well 
now we don't have to account for those uh, wacky combos that the Rosada lineup had. And they baited Asadis very well into trying to fight team fights, but Vogue swung back and pushed those team fights in their favor. They got two team fights um, almost back to back that worked out well for them. And immediately Rogue just teleported to the bot lane and finished the game. So Rogue did win. And I do think that um, Astralis should be ashamed that they lost this game in the end. Because, I mean, come on. Like, y you have a Baron, you have an Ocean Soul, you have a team fight that works, uh, team composition that works very well for you. Um, Rogue should not have been allowed to win this game. Now, obviously, it's a two-sided coin, right? Where Astralis fails to act, um, Rogue needs to step up, and they did, which is incredibly impressive from them. But overall, it was just a nail-biter. As I said before, I definitely watch, uh, would recommend watching this entire game to get uh, very excited, get some adrenaline pumping, because that's definitely what was happening in this game. Then we had G2 versus Fnatic. Um, obviously, the match of the week. Lots of pressure coming in for uh, Caps, who was a former Fnatic player, but mostly for Reckless, right? Who made the swap. And many people, I think, would expect that, especially because of the performance on day one. G2 would easily win this. Fnatic had looked scrappy. G2 had looked nothing but dominant. Uh, but we got a very entertaining match. There was a hectic early game with plays all over the map. G2 getting the first two kills, but Fnatic got kills back to make it even. And then we had another pause. Uh, as it turned out... G2 was playing the entire match with a lot of packet loss and a lot of ping, um, where they were, I think, on 100 MS almost the entire match, and sometimes they just couldn't get updates from the game itself, which made it obviously very difficult for them to play. Um, it's obviously uh, sad when that happens, um, almost inevitable to fix in, uh, or, or impossible to fix in the moment, right? And... Um, yeah, that, that, that definitely you could see that sometimes, for example, Wunder on the Camille, he would jump to a wall and stay there instead of using the momentum to bounce to another location, which is basically what you want to do with that ability, right? And um, I have to say, though, after this pass, Fnatic, um, like, they played so well. <laughs> they, they played so well, so aggressively, and knew very well when to pick on G2. And I think... Brippo, especially in this game on the Volley Bear, he had some score to settle because that man was a beast. He was jumping on the enemies, dealing so much damage. Um, G2 tried to make some plays, but Fnatic, every single time, even if G2 was a three-man dive in the bot lane, for example, um, on one person, that one person on Fnatic would get a kill back. So that was incredibly impressive from, from them. Um, at 20 minutes, Fnatic had three drakes, um, it was 10-15 in kills, and as I said, I think highlights a uh, performance from Brippo, who has not always looked very good this split so far, I think, of the team members. Um, I mean, he's been about average, right, overall, with some good moments, some bad moments, but this, this play um, in this fight... He was absolutely insane. Uh, one uh, absolutely funny moment was when... Like he was being chased by three G2 members in a scrappy team fight, and he just jumped back with the volley barrel just to kill Reckless. Uh, and in the post game interview, said, like, Yeah, I, I tore his head off his neck or something like this. <laughs> um, a little bit of banter, but um, yeah, G2 was fighting an uphill battle basically the entire time after the match started and when the ping started to hit. Uh, again, with the caveat that um, they were playing on a lot of packet loss. Um, still, Fnatic played very well, um, and I think this sets up for a good uh, return fight for um, when they meet again, and I think that's definitely something to look forward to. So, with all the matches wrapped up, let's take a look at the scores. At the top, we have Rogue with a 6-1 score, still in the number 1 position. G2 suffers another loss and goes 1-1 one one this weekend as well, with a 5-2 score. Shokan of Fear climbs up a spot and finds themselves at the 5-2 score shared with G2 so they're shared in second place. Then we have Fnatic, Mad Lions, NXL all at a 4-3 score, SK with a 3-4 score in 7th place, Misfits at 8th with 2-5, and five. Astralis at 9th with 1-6 and, and lastly we have Vitality with a 1-6 score 
as well. So they are shared with Astralis in the ninth place. So some thoughts about the teams in general. When we look at Rogue, I think it's undeniable that their team fighting is still incredibly good. I have to say though that once again, in, um, especially in the first game Rogue played this weekend, that I do think that Trimby was a liability for the team and that his team just knows very well how to cover for the mistakes he makes. And um, it's it's something that could definitely hinder them as their progress, right? Obviously, he's a rookie, so he has, needs time to grow. And um, maybe that needs to extend into the summer split, where he just becomes more confident in playing. But so far, I would definitely say that um, he has not been uh, performing as well as he needs to in order for Rogue to have a chance at winning the split. Um, but I also have to say that Rogue did get outdrafted um, twice this weekend. And I think that's something they definitely need to look into. I think that when you have a team such as G2 um, or maybe a Fnatic last year, you don't have to focus as much on a composition. I think Grabs has said that they draft mostly for their lanes uh, instead of really for the team fights. And because they are so good individually that they can manage how to pick the team fights against other opponents in the LEC. But I don't think that's something that Rogue can do. And I think that is something that Rogue has been trying more where their compositions just didn't really come online. And I think that they really need to take a look at how they draft and how they play out their games from there. Then we have G2. Um, obviously, their loss against Fnatic is sad. Um, circumstances, obviously, um, not working in their favor here. But overall, I wouldn't be too worried about G2. The only thing that I could see happening is maybe getting some friction within the team if they still have to play on like a large amount of ping or something like that. But I think the managerial staff will definitely look into this and make it um, work as well as possible. So I'm not too worried about them. Still, people like Reckless in individually performed very well. Wunder still playing very well. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't worry too much uh, about G2 in general. Shokun of Fear, I've definitely been very impressed with their performance so far. After the week one split, um, opening that, you know, was just poor with them going one and two with even the game that they won, they probably shouldn't have won because they kind of stole that away. But yeah, the way they've bounced back and the way they've found how they want to play as was highlighted on the broadcast but also just how the dynamic works in the team i think something you saw in week one is that they just didn't really know where to go or how to play out the later stage of the game and now they seem to have a found solid voice of solid direction with the team and it's definitely you know good to see it's good to see the team stepping up given the names that they have um yeah exciting stuff now we have fanatic who um uh, well, they got two wins, right? Um, but I'm still very lost when it comes to this team. Um, they win against G2 and they look incredible there. With good aggression, good coordination. And then they play Astralis, who is one of the worst teams in the in the league at the moment. Let's not beat around the bush. And Fnatic looks shit. Like, straight up trash. And that's something that Whippo said as well. Um, in a post-game interview that he's just incredibly disappointed and um, he's right, right? He's, he's he's definitely speaking the truth and Fnatic has a lot of issues to fix going forward still. Um, seeing that they are able to pull it together when they play against G2 and are uh, able to come together and play as a team is definitely something good to see. So I do think that we're still talking easily about a playoffs team and perhaps in the best of fives, um, once they keep making this slow progress, it's slow progress, but steady progress. And I think we'll still see a very good team there. Mad Lions. Um, I don't know. I think that they are looking weaker at the moment than they ended last split. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because they have two new players on the team, right? So we need to find that, that, that flow a bit more. But it's actually the players like Humanoid and Karzy on Mad Lions who have failed to impress me a lot. Like... Humanoid in the previous weeks has run it down a few times. Karsi this time, um, he plays very carefree. And I think that there's some value to this, right? Like, don't put too much pressure on an individual game. But these games matter, right? In the end, you still have to make playoffs. And we're almost at the halfway point. So you really cannot keep 
flipping the game, you have to at some point start playing seriously if you know that you are a better team Prove it. You don't have the luxury that a G2 has. You don't have the luxury of being able to lose a few games here and there randomly. That's just not what Mad Lions can do. So as a team, I hope that they will approach the next games more seriously. I think next week they have a very important match coming up against Rogue. So they definitely need to show that they can be serious and that they can pull out the wins when it matters. And sure... They played against, hang on, let me let me scroll back. They played against Vitality and won that game. But it's Vitality, who are probably the worst team in the league right now. So Mad Lions, really please um, play more seriously. It's something I definitely want to see. Then we have XL. XL, I'm very impressed by. Going a 2-0 weekend for them is obviously very big. And their goal is making playoffs, which they have failed to do uh, <laughs> every single year that they've been in the LEC. So... Yeah, I hope for them that they were able to make it. As I said before, I think Kreis stepping up more as a carry in the top lane is a positive side to see. He showed maybe like one or two glimpses of that last summer split, but the team mostly played through Patrick. But now the diversity is opening up more. Chocolat played very well. I think still, as I said, Torre, um, he's played okay this weekend. Not as bad as the beginning. But um, still often leaves quite a bit to be desired. And then, as I mentioned before, jungle is an incredibly impactful role at the moment. And he is not stepping up in the way that other junglers are stepping up for the team. So there's improvement there for XL. Still though, 2-0 weekend. Their early game, uh, mid game and late game overall have looked pretty clean. So there's improvements there for them. Then we have SK. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what it is with SK. Because um, they sometimes you can see, okay, this is a team, this is this is a squad of rookies that um, can get there. Um, but then you have a game against Excel where they just completely crumble. And for them, games against Excel is where they need to take the wins, right? These are the opponents that they should be able to take down if they really want to contest for a playoff spot. At the moment, they're not doing so. Not consistently, at least. And I think something that Vedi has mentioned on the broadcast very well is that they don't really have a direction where they want to play as a team. And I think that that is going to hurt them if they don't pick it up. Like, maybe next week, okay, try to figure out the last few things, but then we have a one-week break, and then we're already heading into the final four weeks, um, the final half of the regular season. So they really need to pick up the pace if they want to be able to consistently contest for a playoff spot. Misfits, um, sad story. Four game loss streak at the moment. Um, after going 2-1 and one in the opening week, they've lost all their matches. I don't know what's happening in the team. I saw a tweet from Deficio saying that uh, a lot of work needs to be done within the team. I don't know if that mean means that they're going to try to rotate some of their players because, as I said, they have that seven-man roster. But at the moment, all they do is fight all over the place and they fight poorly. So disappointing to see them go down so early. I think definitely um, their champion pool needs to be broadened. And I'm not just talking about Viteo because he did play decently, I guess, this week, even though he wasn't really on uh, on his Zoe, right? That's the champion he's known for now, but he played on Blanc. He played, actually, he played pretty well on Blanc, but it's just a shit champion at the moment, so they should never have picked it here. And um, yeah, overall, I think this team just has a lot of work to do. Um, sad to see them crumble, honestly. Um, Asualis, again, I see improvement in this team, and that is something I really like to see, that they're proving people wrong in putting them as 10th, because I definitely don't think this is a 10th place team at the moment, where um, you have four veterans, right, and one rookie coming into the team. Now, I'm not going to be there on the bush or, or, or shoving it any up. They're still bad, right? The way they lost against Rogue is shit. It shouldn't be allowed to happen, but you can see that overall, they're making small signs of improvement, um, which is good for them. Not sure if they're actually going to be able to contest for a playoff spot, but I wouldn't say that they're the 10th place team because that is uh, reserved for Vitality. Um, yeah, it's just garbage. Like, the players, 
are not playing together well, they are not proactive on the map, they don't know how to approach the mid or the late game, so a lot of work needs to do, be done there. And I'll say it again, I had high hopes for Vitality, right? I think that these players overall could do great things. You have Shigenda, who is, like, he came from a go rogue who dominated the uh, the Ultra Liga. Then you have Skeens, who is, pro like, he can play jungle very well. We saw it in the summer split. With Milicia, I don't think that he has shown up, like, a lot, but just, like, not a terrible mid laner, I suppose. With Comp, who is a good AD carry, with Labrov, and Labrov has been playing very bad so far in the split. Um, undeniably, um, maybe even, mm, I, I guess maybe Promiscu has been playing worse as a support, but Labrov has been playing poorly as well. But still, they have four players on their team that are at least decent to good. So as a team, they should be able to come together and play better. But they're just not doing it at the moment, and it's uh, definitely disappointing. Then finally, let's take a look at my LEC Super Fantasy standings, uh, the top 10 at the moment. I have to say that it was a terrible weekend for me. <laughs> uh, no, not the great at all, um, with placing some very poor bets and especially uh, betting on G2. But also I wasted one of those events, uh, Gathering of Warlords, where you have to have five players each from a different country. And I forgot that Larsen and Reckless are from Sweden, even though it, they have the flag, so I wasted... Um, a bonus there. Anyway, let's take a look. Uh, we have Stepan at the top at 1745 points. Then we have Witta at 1690. Loco X follows with 1595 points. Then it's me with 1531 points. Closing in the top five is Noodles, the G2 analyst with 1508 points. Just dropping below the 1500 bar is Lucky Reed with 1456 points. Then we have Panda Barely's at 14 and 33. Bene follows with a clean 1400 points. Ninth place is Goldfire 432 with 1363 points. And last uh, in the top 10, but definitely still playing very well in the league, is Akon with 1330 points. So. Those were all my thoughts on the weekend. Let me know in the comments below what you found interesting moments of the weekend. If you like my content and if you like my interviews, but also these videos or maybe a mix of both, um, please for don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps my channel a lot. And I'll see you all on Thursday with the LG preview. But I have quite some interviews coming out this week as well. So stay tuned and I'll see you when I see you.